Hi, welcome to James Miller Lifeology, where you learn to simplify and transform your spirit, mind, and body. My name is James Miller. I'm a licensed psychotherapist and a composer. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Let's get started. Did you know that on jamesmillerlifeology.com, you can enroll in the academy I created for listeners just like you? I've created courses you may take at your own pace, which will help you simplify and transform your spirit, mind, and body. Enroll in one of the classes today. I have a great show for you today. I'm going to help you create your legacy. I'll also be interviewing motivational speaker Will Little, who found his purpose and created his family legacy after being in prison for third degree murder. For more information about Will, please visit willvlittle.com. I have some exciting news. Did you know that I'm on the radio three times a week? You may hear me on the same station on Tuesdays at 1.30 p.m., Fridays at 9.30 a.m., and Saturdays at 12.30 p.m. You may also hear me anytime on iHeartRadio as well as on all the other major podcasting platforms, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and many others. Simply search for the show name, James Miller Lifeology. Are you struggling today to find your purpose? Has mediocrity set in and you can't imagine doing the same thing for the rest of your life? Are your relationships struggling or you aren't sure how to make long lasting changes in your life? Then today, contact me, James Miller. I will help you recognize the areas in your life that are going really well. And then we'll look at the areas in which you are struggling. We will create actionable solutions to help you create long lasting changes in your life. You don't have to do this alone. Go to my website, jamesmillerlifeology.com and click on the page, work with James. Fill out the form and it will be sent directly to me. Don't let another day go by without finding your way. Your change can start today. Once again, go to my website, jamesmillerlifeology.com and click on the page, work with James. Fill out that form to get started today. Creating your legacy. The word legacy means something that's been passed down from one's predecessor. Often we think of that as some type of material thing, for example, finances or houses. But when we step back and look at that in a broader spectrum, It's essentially what one generation or one person passes on to the next person. That can be through your family, that can be through what you pass on to your friends, or even in a situation you're in each day. What are you known for? The attributes that you demonstrate to other people is a legacy you leave once you walk out that door, once you leave your office. One question I always ask people is when you leave an event or a situation, can you leave with confidence knowing that you enhanced that event or did you hinder it? The characteristics that we demonstrate are associated with who we are. If you're known as the person who's always laughing, that's associated with joy. You're creating a legacy of joy with each person you interact with. If you're known as the grumpy person or the downer, then unfortunately, that's the characteristics that you're demonstrating. That's the legacy you've created for yourself when you spend time with your friends. From a broader spectrum, let's look at this from a family systems standpoint. My grandfather laughed a lot. He loved to joke. He would always play practical jokes on people and was very mischievous. He passed that down to my father. My father loved to laugh. He was always playing practical jokes on people and he was known for his laughter. That's been passed down to me as well. I love to laugh and I'm very mischievous. That's one beautiful trait or legacy that my family passed down to me. When you look at what's been passed down through your family system, what is noted? Go back as far as you can to maybe your grandparents or even your parents or even your siblings. What characteristics were demonstrated that was passed down through each generation? If you were around someone who yells a lot, Unfortunately, maybe you yell and you pass that down to your children as well. Now, of course, there's no judgment in any of this at all because many times we don't realize that we're creating a legacy for the people around us, for when we leave a room or for even our family or for our business. So it's really important for you to ask yourself today, what kind of legacy would you like to leave per event or even at the end of life? For what would you like to be known? What do you leave for the people around you? For your family, do you leave finances? Do you leave characteristics? Do you leave your faith? Do you leave respect? or even in a situation you're in each day. The conversations that you have, are they uplifting conversations with other people? Are they full of joy? Are you cautious of what you say about other people? It's very important that we're mindful of how we interact with the people around us, but it's also mindful of what we instill or teach the people around us. Now, some of you may say, well, James, I didn't grow up the way you grew up. I didn't grow up with a grandfather who laughed a lot or a father who laughed a lot or I didn't grow up with money, or I didn't grow up with this, or I wasn't exposed to that. The great thing about that is you get to be the first person to start that legacy. You get to be the first person to instill these characteristics or influence your surroundings with whatever you'd like. Do you teach your children to be respectful? Do you teach them integrity? Do you teach them the importance of hard work? Or even your friends? Do you remind them that it's not kind to talk about people negatively? 
Are you compassionate to them? Are you benevolent to them? To strangers on the street? Do you create a legacy just even in that moment of changing their life? It's important for each of us to recognize that everything we do leaves a legacy from the smallest interaction or for generations to come. Be mindful that people watch you. You are a leader and you can change your world should you want to. But it's important that you change it in the way that's true to yourself. Create your legacy today. A quick example of one of the courses you'll find in the Academy entitled Spirit, Mind, Body, The Perfect Triad. This non-religious course helps you understand how your intuition, or rather your gut, your logic, and your body all work together to help you overcome any obstacle you may face. Enroll in the class today. We all have moments of truth in our lives. For some, it's a moment of self-discovery, a time to stay true to oneself. My guest today is Will Little, who had two powerful moments of truth. You will hear his incredible transformational story and find out which choice he made. Welcome to my show, Will. Thanks for having me, James. Yes, I am looking forward to this. You have a phenomenal story, and I know my listeners are going to be blown away by all the things that you're doing today. Yes, indeed. The person with whom I'm speaking is not the person that originally started out in life. Give us a little bit of your backstory, and then obviously we'll jump right into the elements that, that made you have to make some of these choices. Okay, making a short story, not too long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, I grew up in a single-parent home in the area of Philadelphia, PA, uh, raised by my mother and three older sisters with one younger sister. So my father was kind of obsolete in my life. He mm-hmm. wasn't around, and I didn't have that directional guidance that I look for as a young man, that role model to follow, that image to um, to want to be once I got to become a man. Mm-hmm. So um, eventually I was like a quiet kid that always reflected and laid back and just observed everyone. And I knew um, just living in a house full of women that there are certain things I could not do and there are certain things that I had to do, especially as um, a protector or the man in the house. Mm -hmm. So growing older, uh, getting to my teenage years, I think the first bad experience or traumatical experience that I had that kind of kind of shaped my m- mentality uh, for the streets was when uh, I was I jumped into a fight with my mother and her boyfriend at the time, and um, he, um, I swung on his back a few times. He threw me off his back. Told me if you think I'm, if I think I was a man to come on outside, and I'm, he's going to show me what a man was. Oh so gosh, I was so wow. angry and frustrated at the time. I didn't think about it. I didn't think about the fact that, you know, this guy would be drunk sometime. I didn't think about the fact that he carried a gun. Mm-hmm. I didn't think about none of that. I just thought about protecting my mother and, you know, and not allowing this to happen or take place in my household because I'm 13, a little taller now. And um, a lot of things I've seen as a kid that I was too afraid to approach or, or talk about. I mean, it was time now to face it, yeah. the reality. I mean, so when I went outside that day, my mom told me, don't go outside. And I mean, because she wasn't aware of what he might do himself, herself. Sure. So um, I said, like, no, I got to go. I was like, I'm tired of it. I'm fed up. I, mm-hmm. I got to go. I mean, so I went out there and then he grabbed me by my shirt, threw me up against the wall, you know, pulled out his 38 Dillinger and he pointed like 12 inches away from my face, you know. And oh my gosh. I was like so angry and so mad. I didn't move. I didn't jump. I didn't flinch. I just stared at him the whole time. Mm-hmm. I just stared, stared. And I thought about where my father's at. My father, I need him right now. My uncles, I need them right now. I mean, but they're not here. So I got to deal with this. So. I just stared at him and he just said to me, don't ever jump into a fight with me and your mother again. And I was like, just looking at him like this guy, he's going to pull a gun out on a kid for real. Wow. Like to me, I was blown away by it. But then I was just just that much angrier because two, he pulled a gun out on the kid. Three, um, he was abusing my mother. Four, my father wasn't around mm-hmm. to protect any of us. You know, so all that just boiled up into in my mind. It's like to myself, like I'm going to kill this guy when I get older. He's taking advantage. I mean, and. From that moment, I mean, I wasn't afraid of anything after that. After he left and walked around the corner, I went upstairs in the house, checked on my mom. I asked her, was she okay? She asked me, was I okay? And I was like, yes, but I really wasn't okay because at that moment, I became dehumanized. At that mm-hmm. moment, I became fearless. Yes. You know, and it kind of shaped my mentality now how to deal with people and deal with the streets, the mean streets of Philadelphia where I grew up at. Unfortunately, your you eyes know? were so open to a world that, you know, that, that mm-hmm. innocence that you had as a boy. I mean, of course, you're going to protect your mom, but then when that gun was pulled on you, I mean, all that was just stripped away. Right. I was stripped away. And it's like, I just how I had to be. You know, so I became a product of my environment. Mm-hmm. You know, I grew older. 
I got exposed to more things going to junior high school, the drugs and the people getting high and the quitting, dropping out of school and things of that, that nature. And you know, I was going to school every day, kid. But then when I got exposed to more younger people who had the same kind of challenges, but um, dealt with them differently than I did, it's like, you know, now your mind's open up to a criminal world, yeah. you know, and you see ways to try to make money to take care of yourself because you see your mom struggling all the time with mm-hmm. the lights on and with the water staying hot and with food on the table. So you just try to make a, make an ends meet, you know what I'm saying, by just doing the things you, do you, what you have to you do. Had yeah, to. exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. what you have to do. You know, and that kind of, even being on the street and, and being faced with that criminal element, I mean, you learn more, more um, bad ideas from bad influences and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. for, you know, I just started selling drugs and, and hustling and I dropped out of school. My mom thought I was still going to school, but I was playing like I was going to school because I was a good pretender, you know. So um, I got into the drug trade really, really heavy. Um, me and my friends and then we got more exposed to the Philadelphia period. Like that's my four corners of my block, but people around the neighborhood start noticing, like, you know, young guys with mm-hmm. cars at the time. Because back then in the 80s, people didn't have cars. Kids didn't have 16, 17 years old, didn't have cars yeah. unless their family had money and people knew it. But, you know, we grew up poor, so everybody knew we grew up poor. But by us having money and cars now, they knew we was drug dealers and selling drugs. I hid it as much as I could from my mother. I mean, because I know she would probably go crazy or snap out on me. Sure. I mean, trying to raise me the best way she could. But um, I thought that, I mean, I was a teenager, so I was on my own, and I was I was a man at the time. So when I started making money, it just stopped feeling good to myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. You know, be able to take care of myself, take care of other little kids I knew that didn't eat on the block, stuff like that, and, and mm-hmm. buy, them, buy them something to eat, some dinner, you know, and um but all of us was like into that world and it was just fun for us. It was fun. We didn't really know the dangers that was going to come from all of it. But in the world goes so fast, you just get caught up in it and sure. you just get deeper and deeper and deeper in it. Well, I'm sure your self-esteem really changed as well because you came, yeah. came from something mm-hmm. or came from came. You didn't have the things that you had, obviously, once you had the money, the influence, the notoriety, right. um, all that really changed. Yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Why people continually mm-hmm. to do do those things? I mean, because it, there comes so much status and some something that you never had before. All of a sudden, you have, and so it, it really does make perfect sense why people go into that trade. Right, because it fills a void, and mm-hmm. the void is being accepted, you know, and the void is not having the have nots, you know, filling that void because now you're able to have, now you're able to buy food for yourself yeah. and eat anytime you want to, get your mm-hmm. own haircuts, buy your own sneakers, you know, and to keep up with the Joneses and things of that nature. You know, and then just having a gun in itself, you know, it's like more power for you. Like now I'm protected. When I was a young kid, I was like, all right, I got to try to wait, find a way to protect myself and my family. But now you have a gun and get you that kind of that kind of image in your mind that, you know, all right, now nobody can mess with me now because I'm invincible. I have a gun. Yeah, exactly. Since you, especially since you had that interaction with that guy as well, you knew the power yeah, of that yeah. gun. You knew exactly how it could right. intimidate other people. Right, exactly. I mean, and just by the words on the street, how people felt about people who carried guns or shot somebody before, they they got they got no the notoriety. Mm-hmm. They were they were more like the celebrities in the neighborhood. Oh, that guy, he's a he's a shooter. Don't mess with him. Or he's a killer. Don't mess with him. You know, so people had respect for guys like that. They didn't bother them. And even though I wasn't trying to chase respect, I was I was I always gave respect to people. Yeah. But at the same time, I ain't allow nobody to harass or bother me or my family. I mean, once I got into that lifestyle. And one time, eventually, after my friend got shot 11 times, that was another um, another experience that, you know, we didn't think we would experience at a young age. And we knew the game was really serious at the time mm-hmm. when my friend got shot 11 times in his car because he wasn't a drug dealer or carry guns. You know, he wasn't even like us. He wasn't even living the lifestyle we was living. Oh, and I was like, out of all people, he could kill. I mean, not one of us, you know. Yeah. So... Just shows you that um, it could be anybody can go at any time, and that even shaped my mind even more. And now I gotta really be on a protective end of not only myself, but my family, my sisters, and my friends because mm-hmm. they they were getting high. I mean, they was kind of not they they kind of really wasn't aware of what things was going on because we in the streets because they getting high off of you know the supply and mm-hmm. stuff. And I was a guy I never got high. I mean, I never used drugs or anything, you know. So um, I always try to be aware and alert, and um. Eventually, we got into another altercation at um, a skating ring with another group of guys who was, you know, has something against us because, you know, we was making money and we were young and we were making money and people got jealous. Mm-hmm. And we got into an altercation with some guys in the skating ring. And once we came out, they, they started shooting at us. And I fired my gun back, killing one of the guys. 
that night. And then I was arrested three weeks later for um, a slew of charges, um, attempted murder on on attempted murder on a witness, uh, aggravated assault on another guy, a murder um, conspiracy. With, I locked up with three of my friends and um, weapons charge. So they were seeking a death penalty in my case. And we had like the best DA in the, in the, in the city who put everybody away for life yeah, or death, nice, you know, on our case. So it was more so like, all right, this is this is really real right now. Mm-hmm. Um, what's happening is about to be real. But I had to stand in my truth either way. You know, I had to accept my responsibilities or the things I did and deal with the consequences. And that's a powerful thing because many people don't realize that sometimes, you know, society can think that one is a victim to whatever. And yeah, in some ways that may be true, but the reality is we all make choices and in those choices there comes natural consequences right. and consequences themselves are something right. we all deal with. It depends on how, you know, obviously what the behavior is, but there's always natural consequences. Right. And we don't, we didn't have consequential thinking back that time. Mm-hmm. You know, even though we've seen it happen over and over to other people, get through, through the shooting, get locked up, sell drugs, get locked up. We didn't have consequential thinking. We just thought that we were smarter than everybody else. Yeah. You know, um, being arrested, you know, it was a hardship for my mother and my sisters because I was the only boy, you know, mm-hmm. and um, just knowing that her son has changed, my mentality has changed, and she didn't really see it because I always kept it away from her. You know, all that activity, I kept it away from her as much as I could. So um, now me being arrested at 19 years old, you know, it was more so now a reality. I'm in a real jail. I've never been locked up before. I've never been caught for any crime that I committed as a teen, as a um, juvenile. So I know it wasn't juvenile placement, anything. So this is the first time I'm ever in real jail. I mean, and I knew how to adapt to my environment. So... Just going in the, in, in the prison it was Holmesburg Prison, which is the worst prison oh in the Pennsylvania system at that time, where everybody with high bills, even like the mafia, everybody was in the jail. You know, so it was a real um, radical and wild place to be. Like murder is still going on inside the jail, rapes getting people wow. getting raped, people getting extorted. How old were you at this time? Nineteen. Oh my gosh, nineteen! You know, and just so, before you went into prison, you you find that your girlfriend was two weeks pregnant. Yes. Yeah. She was two weeks pregnant. Oh my gosh. So here you are, your whole thing was you wanted to have, you didn't have a father and then you find that your, your girlfriend is pregnant and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can provide for my child, but now you're in prison and you're sentenced for all these years. I mean, what was going through your mind at that time? Well, actually I didn't know what I had. I was having a boy or a girl at the time, but I knew like, you know, to her, I was I was telling her that, you know, I'm going to be in jail for a long time. I already knew it. Even I didn't want to say life, but mm-hmm. I know that was a great possibility. Sure. Plus, I'm going to be in jail for a long time. So just try to live your life. I mean, on your because she was only 17 at the time. I was oh, 19. Wow. Yeah. I just, just try to live your life, you know, because you got a whole life ahead of you. Don't be locked up with me because I'm in prison. I'm going to be here, you know, and I try to do as much as I could for the baby. So the money I did have before I got locked up in my safe, I just told my sister to give her the money for any any anything she may need for the for the child while she's pregnant, going through her pregnant pregnancy. And um and um um I just thought about a lot of things. So eventually when he was born, I, I found out it was a boy. So it was like more so now I really gotta like all right, I really gotta um, do something with myself in order to yeah. do something for him. You know what I mean? Because I know for young men it's really hard, especially young African American men, it's really, really hard in the environment that we live in and come up in, you know, and without that guidance and direction, I can see him following the same steps I fell into, you know, mm-hmm. in the streets or in prison or even murder. And I didn't want that for him, you know. So I decided to change my life around. He was like my why. He was like the strongest why that I had in my life at the time. Came to purpose, yes. actually, yeah, yeah, actually focus on who I was and even these natural abilities that I had as a kid, you know, I don't know what made me sit back and say, all right, I want to change my life, not just consciously, but subconsciously mm-hmm. make the decision and really follow through with it. But I'm a serious person. I was serious when I was a kid, you know, so when I was a kid, I always think about life and death and I think about, you know, the purpose of living. I would think about choices I made or people make and why we live the way we live, why we was poor. So I had a lot of questions in my head that always lingered that resurface when now I'm at this t- I'm taking this time to have a moment of clarity mm-hmm. with the, the behavior I was having on the streets and how I became that way. So I just looked at my life and said, how did I become this person yeah. that didn't care? I mean, didn't feel took responsibility. You know, yeah. I mean, so I, I had to stand on my truth and, and in order to do that, I had to understand that the power of forgiveness was really, really um, important for me to forgive people that, you know, hurt my family or, 
or my father not being there or my mother trying her best or the guy who put the gun in my face or the things that I did to other people, you know what I mean, hurt other people, whether I robbed or stole or or on a shot somebody, killed somebody, a family member or stuff like that. So I had to forgive myself in order for me to like uh, even step to the next level. And then I knew that this emotional intelligence was – is. I didn't know the term of it then, but I didn't know mm-hmm. I was actually going through the steps of emotional intelligence. Yes. And when That's I started good. bringing about self-awareness, I mean, I knew that self-education was very important because I dropped out of school in 10th grade. So I knew that the key to success was education, K-E-Y-S, key, keep educating yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, so I just started learning. Uh, I went to school, got my GED and everything else. Um, and then I just started learning about life. Like nobody's teaching this life. School is not teaching this life. You know, I experience teaches life. So I had to start paying attention to my life, my family life, my sister's life. Like wonder why we make all the decisions and choices that we make, you know, based on our circumstances and situations. And what, what is in control of us? What is in control of me? You know, what is controlling my choices, you know? So I really had to just look at life and just learn from magazines and papers and movies. I just, my perception started changing uh, the reality that I wanted to see and create for myself. And your awareness expanded so exponentially. I mean, that whole aspect of, you know, you found your why, in other words, your child. And then with that, you had, you found your purpose where it sounds like before you didn't have a purpose. It was no it wasn't any fault right. of your own. You just weren't exposed to that. Didn't know that there was more options for you than what you had been exposed to before. So after ten years, you were removed, or you were released from prison. And what did you end up doing after that? Well, I knew it would be challenging when I left prison because of like all the inmates that come back to prison during my ten years. Mm-hmm. They always had reasons why they came back or excuses. I would say, I like to say the system set them up, the parole board set them up, the halfway house set them up. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they not giving jobs to guys. I mean, out there with felons and stuff like that. So I can't get employment. So all those things I already knew in my head. But even though I didn't have no kind of work experience on the streets, I knew I had to be. Uh, creative in some kind of way to make money because I didn't want to go back to selling drugs. Mm-hmm. I knew what that would get me. I mean, I knew what me- mentality that would create because it's still in me. It's just contained. Sure. I mean, and so once I got out of jail, in order for me to stay the course and stay following my purpose, you know, I had to start challenging myself. And that's one thing that we don't do. We don't challenge mm-hmm. ourselves enough. So I started challenging myself to do different things that I never did before because I knew, I understood that if if I did the same things, I would get the same things. If I did something new, I never knew what my potential really was. You know what I mean? And what outcome it may bring that would be more prosperous and successful. So I just challenged myself to learn more about everything that I was doing. And so if it's business, it's writing proposals, if it's if it's running the show, uh, like my, my, my poetry and motion show I created to actually bring awareness to the community about some of our dilemmas that we face, whether it's wow. um, my business poetry in a bottle that I started, I mean, from the barbershop, selling, selling my poetry and stuff like that. You know, teaching poetry classes in the community, going back to the schools and teaching young kids who were facing the same kind of problems I was facing as a young kid growing up in the environment and in the cities. You know, so all those particular things, I just had ideas in my mind, how I was going to make money, or even be a pro boxer, you know. And I just looked at a letter that I wrote, my, I sent to my mom. She gave it to me like a month ago. I wrote her letter in 1997, a year before I was about to come home to the halfway house. Mm-hmm. And that letter is, is my plans, my plans to come home, you know, and, and make money and maybe be a boxer or and get a regular job and start working and, and make as much money as I could make and to elevate myself and grow, get back to the community. So everything on that plan that I had for her, I looked at it myself like recently, like, like wow, I did everything I said I was going to yeah, do. That's amazing, Will. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I really like how you took responsibility as well. You know, you heard your, your peers when they would uh, return to prison. And there are all those excuses. And it sounds like from the very beginning, when you went into prison, like we said earlier, you took responsibility for that, the natural consequences that happened. And so you knew that there would be consequences. Should you be a victim to the world again and say, well, I had to do this or I had to return to drugs or I had to do this. And you found that that's, that's not what you wanted. So I really like to hear, it really goes with your character as well, that you realize there's cause and effect. You do something, right. this is for everybody. You do something and there is a reward or there's a punishment, but there is cause and effect. And I love hearing how you knew you don't want to go back to that because you knew what those consequences would be. It's incredibly inspiring. Now, you today you talk to. I, mean, I know you've did like you've done TED talks. You've done so many other things. Tell more of my listeners what it is that you're doing beyond um, what you ever thought you could do. Well, one thing I did when I, I wrote my autobiography, 
and without no no teaching or schooling on how to actually put that together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I asked a few questions to people and I read a few books. I'm not really an avid reader. I mean, I just I read certain things that's relevant to my growth and development. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, yeah, but not really too many stories. So when I start wanting to write my book, I just looked at other books and started seeing how they formatted everything and and how they opened the book and in the back of the book. So I said, I'm gonna write my book. I'm gonna sit down, take an hour after work, and just come home and just write my life story. Only only reason why I wanted to write it was to give a history to my younger my my sons and my son's sons and the children that come after that that generation because with me especially many african americans a lot of us don't know who our fathers are mm -hmm. and a lot of us don't know who our grandparents are so we don't really know uh, what legacy was left behind for us you know yeah. and what natural abilities or gifts that we may have you know i had to discover those things myself and i kind of realized that after i met my father um Years later, after I got out of prison, I went to go see him. I probably seen him twice before he passed away um, within his last 20 years, you know, because he lived down south in North Carolina. But just seeing him and uh, having a conversation with him, not really a deep conversation because he was in the hospital mm -hmm. at the time, but just looking at his features and looking at some of his habits and how he talked, I started to identify myself with somebody for once and for all, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, this is what I wanted to leave for my children, my sons and their sons, you know, to when they go back and they can look in the book and they can go online, go on Amazon and say, I'm going to get my grand, my great grandfather wrote a book. <laughs> that's and I amazing. Know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I want to know awesome. what I mean. Well, about his life and, and how that affects me. And maybe I'm a writer because my dad, my, own, my great grandfather was a poet. Yeah. Or maybe I'm 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 tenacious because he kept going. And he never gave up. Persevered. So those kind of attributes you could look at themselves. So when I wrote the book, I just wrote about life in general, and people started like you know being inspired by it. You know, awesome. and it was by surprise, like all walks of life. I'm gonna be white, black, young, rich, poor. Everybody's now, I'm getting reviews from everybody that say they really got some good nuggets out in the book on my story. I mean, just like the TED Talk did. I got a call from a guy from India. I mean, not a call, but yeah. yeah, he found me on, on on Instagram and he was like, I just, I listened to your TED Talk and it was very inspiring. Everybody in my village listened to it. It was very, very inspiring. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That must yeah. be so powerful for you. We only have a couple more seconds, but that must be so powerful yeah. for you when you look at how you started and then all that you transverse, all that you, you went through. And then on the other side, you are literally inspiring the world around you. I mean, that must feel incredible, Will. It, it is incredible. Just me just reflecting back because I, I still be in the neighborhood that I grew up in and I did most of my crime in. Uh -huh. And just going to that corner again where I should stand on that corner as a young guy and sell drugs, looking at myself now, like I thought my life was only... Um, surrounded by this four block radius wow. and now I'm touching the whole world. You know what I mean? That's the so show a kid come from this point to one extreme to the next extreme in one lifetime. Yes. Wow. Well, little, thank you so much for guesting with us today. I really, really appreciate your time and your story. If my listeners would like to find out more information about you and all these amazing things that you're doing, where would they find this information online? Well, they can find me on Facebook under Will uh, Little or Will Latif Little, L-A-T-I-F Little, or you can find my website, Will V Little, V as in Victor, uh, W I L L V L I T T L E dot com. And you'll find my website there and you'll find more information about me. See the TED Talk on there. Some documentaries like are coming out this year, maybe on HBO, Showtime, um, that I'm working on, we're working on. So there's a lot of stuff, good things happening now for me. You know, the, that, that law of attraction is really real. That's what I try yes, to teach people about what you put out there, you will get back. Yes. Well, well, once again, thank you. I really did appreciate your time today. It's, it's phenomenal talk. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. I also want to thank you, the listener, for tuning in today. Please subscribe to this radio show through whichever portal you joined with us today, or please go to my website where you may sign up for my free newsletter, watch my YouTube episodes, read the articles I've written specifically for you, or you may enroll in the Lifeology Academy where you can take self-directed courses which will help you simplify and transform your spirit, mind, and body. If you'd like to personally work with me, be a guest on or advertise on this show, simply visit jamesmillerlifeology.com. Be sure to follow me on all social media platforms under the name James Miller Lifeology, except for Twitter, which is James M. Lifeology. Once again, thank you so much for your support and I'll talk to you soon.